well, I will go ahead and get started. And if anybody joins in after, we can rewind a couple steps and go from there. So welcome to Introduction to Plated Jewelry. Uh, today, the goal is to go through a little bit of history of plated jewelry and show some examples, and then go ahead and make a piece from beginning to end. Uh, so you can see kind of the process, um, see how it works. And then hopefully uh, the goal is by the end of it, be able to go and create your own. So a good portion of the hordes throughout the Viking age uh, consists mostly of a good portion of just jewelry, jewelry and accessories. Um, we see a lot of bracelets, arm rings, um, upper arm rings that are worn above the elbow, uh, neck rings, finger rings, um, all kinds of personal jewelry that may have been important to the person wearing it, uh, may have been stolen, may have been uh, stored there for safekeeping. <clears throat> so those range from two or three wires twisted together in a more simple pattern um, to more complex ornate plated pieces. Um, plating is a technique that utilizes twists and counter twists. So it derives its name from the method used to create it. You twist strands of wire in pairs or sets in one direction. And then when you make the final piece, you twist the whole thing in the opposite direction. Um, this is what kind of gives it that characteristic look of a plated piece. The opposite to that is cabling, where you twist all of the wires in one direction, so say counterclockwise. And then when you twist the final piece, you twist them all counterclockwise again. That makes it look, look more like a rope or a cable. Uh, the plated looks are beautiful. Um, they are striking in appearance and design. Uh, it's beautiful to follow the piece as it wraps around itself. Uh, and it's just, they're just great pieces of jewelry. <clears throat> so the handout is designed to display period examples and show you how to do the process and create your own jewelry. Uh, before we really get into it, there are a couple terms we're gonna be using in the course that I kinda of wanna go over. Uh, so the first one is gonna be a strand. A strand is a single wire, um, which you can also refer to as a wire. Um, strand and wire are pretty interchangeable. A set is a set number of wires twisted together. Um, so we're gonna be using two strands together that are twisted into a set. Uh, a bundle is two or more of these sets twisted together. So when we take the three sets that we have and put them together, it's gonna make our bundle. Uh, annealing, which is something we're gonna talk about pretty often. Uh, that's the process of heating up the wire and then cooling it down either by air or in a quench bucket. Um, I prefer to use a quench bucket because it's fast and it's easy and allows you to keep going right away. Uh, but you can also cool in air, it just takes a little longer. Um, but it's the process of heating it and cooling it and makes it a little softer and more malle malleable. Um, as the metal works, you will work hard in it. And so you will need to anneal fairly often. Um, it actually changes the molecular structure of the metal to make it softer. If you work the metal while it's too hard, you run the risk of cracking or breaking uh, the piece. Um, you can break the wires. So annealing is a crucial step and one that we will be using quite often. So the piece we'll look at today is making a three by two. Uh, so when you look at the name three by two, um, it's a set of numbers. So the first number, the three, denotes how many sets are in the bundle. And the second number, the two, is how many wires per set. So in this case, we're gonna use three sets of wires with two wires per set. Uh, the method that we'll be going over was uh, shown to me and taught to me by Duke Eichbrander of the Middle Kingdom and Master Sen Thunheim. I adapted it to really work with what I have available in this area. Uh, in my shop uh, and to adjust kind of what worked best for me. 
Uh, of course, we will be using a, a high heat torch. We'll be working with hot metal. Um, the metal can be sharp when you cut it. So always wear proper safety gear and protection when handling it. <clears throat> so first things first, um, you're gonna need some tools and material. Uh, first and foremost, you're gonna need the wire. So depending on what you wanna do or how you wanna finish it, there's several options available. Um, in, this, uh, in this tutorial, we'll be using bronze. Um, bronze is a little harder to work, but it's a great choice to begin with. Um, it does require more annealing cycles than copper or silverwood, but it fuses easily, which is the look we're gonna go for uh, in the end. And it's very difficult to do with copper. Um, this copper is a modern alloy. Uh, I get this from Rio Grande, it's a CDA 521. Um, period bronzes had more, uh, more dangerous chemicals, lead and arsenic. So for safety purposes, I use a modern alloy. Uh, you can use copper, which is pretty easy to work, and it is also a great beginning wire. Um, it is soft, it anneals well, you don't have to anneal it quite as often but it does not fuse, so you'll need to know how to solder end caps to the arm ring. Um, we're not gonna go into the soldering or anything today. Uh, so that is an option as well. And then you can use silver. So silver is the easiest metal to work with. Um, it works like a dream. Uh, it's very soft to work. It fuses really well. Um, it does work harden a little more, so you may need to anneal it a little more often than you would like copper. Um, but it is costly. So I recommend starting with copper or bronze just to get the feel of it. And then you can move on to silver if you feel comfortable. Uh, the cost does add up on buying silver for arm rings. That's why I suggest starting with a little more cost effective material. Uh, you are going to need a MAP Pro Torch. Uh, this is one of the yellow tanks. Uh, you can get these at Home Depot. You can get them at any hardware store. Um, you can also use propane, but the heat transfer on the MAP torch is vastly preferable, and it does burn hotter, so it makes it a little easier. Um, we're going to use these to anneal the pieces and fuse the ends together. Uh, you will need a vise to clamp one end of the wires and the bundle while twisting. Um, you're also going to use the vise to clamp the sets while you twist those together. You are going to need a pair of vice grips or two pairs of vice grips. Um, we're going to use those also to twist the other ends of the wire together when we make the set and to twist the final product into the plate of jewelry. You are going to need wire cutters. Uh, these will be used to cut the wire and you'll need a pair of pliers. Uh, these will be used to pick up the hot wire after we're doing annealing it. Uh, try not to uh, grab the metal barehanded. Um, it is hot and uh, I have accidentally done it and it is not fun. Uh, you're going to need a measuring tape. So we're gonna use those to measure out how long the wires are. And then we can also measure the length of the final piece. Fire bricks are one of the more important pieces that you'll need. Uh, the kneeling and fusing are all gonna be done on the fire bricks. So the fire brick, uh, as opposed to trying to anneal it on an anvil or uh, some other metal surface, the fire bricks uh, refract the heat around the piece. So it makes a nice even heat around the whole thing, which is especially important when you want to anneal it or fuse it. Uh, fire bricks are relatively easy to find. You can find them at most hardware stores. Um, the ones I have, here's a small piece uh, these are made for outdoor ovens or outdoor fire ovens uh, or like brick pizza ovens. So they, their jo whole job is to push heat around the whole thing and refract it back up. Uh, you will need a quench bucket if you decide to quench the pieces after annealing. Uh, this will be used to dump the pieces in so it cools it down right away and rapidly. That way you can get right back to going on. If you want to air cool it, that is perfectly fine as well. It is personal preference. 
Uh, at that point, then you would anneal it on a fire brick, and then remove it and put it on an anvil and just let it cool. And finally, you'll need hammer and anvil. Uh, so the hammer and the anvil are going to be used in conjunction for making the terminals. Uh, so we're going to square those out and draw them out. Uh, and those are going to be used for that portion. So looking at some examples in period, uh, we see a couple that are relatively excellent shape. Um, the Sierra Hoard found near Zealand uh, features several plated pieces, um, specifically the pieces on the right hand row and then a couple on the left hand um, flanking that Thor's hammer. Um, these pieces are plated. They've been finished with a hook and clasp uh, or two hooks. Uh, those are extremely well-preserved examples of plating. And then, of course, probably one of the best known and more important cord finds to date is the Keredale Hoard. Uh, this was discovered in 1840 on the banks of the River Ribble. Uh, it contains about 8,600 items deposited somewhere around the early 10th century. Um, Included in the hoard are coins and hacks over pieces, uh, but they do have several plated, plated neck rings, and those are all located in the lower right of the photo. Uh, these are excellent, excellent examples of plated jewelry. Um, they have a variety of styles, a variety of thicknesses, um, and they are extremely well preserved. Uh, a, less, a lesser known find, uh, but just as notable is the Vester Vedsted Hoard. Uh, this was discovered in 1859 and it's just south of Reeb and contains uh, quite a few examples of plated jewelry, uh, specifically the piece in the lower left. Uh, somewhere in the latter half of the 10th century, the original owner deposited this hoard. Uh, it is also an extremely well preserved example. Uh, we can see that the if you follow the piece around, you can see that it is tapered at both ends uh, and it does terminate in looks like two hooks. Uh, these are examples of just fantastic plated pieces uh, and a porch that I base a lot of the pieces off of because they are such well preserved and exemplary examples of, port of plating in the Viking Age. So unfortunately, there is not a lot of surviving evidence on how plated pieces in period were constructed. Um, most of the construction methods that we have modernly, uh, we've recreated using trial and error. Um, most of the construction methods from period have been lost to history, but our results closely match the results that we find in period uh, and as in the examples provided. So we can kind of pull from that, that the method that we use today uh, is reasonably close to the methods that they may have, they may have used in period. Um, both modern pieces and historical artifacts that have been found have a similar look to the finished product. Um, so we can reasonably argue that we're pretty close. Um, we're not, unfortunately not sure, 100% sure how they would have done some of the things in period. Um, for example, fusing is difficult to do in an open forge because uh, you run the risk of melting a huge chunk of the piece instead of just fusing a small portion. Uh, so there's some things that we're not quite 100% sure how it may, may have been done, but we at least know that the main body of it and what we use to do it today is pretty close to what they may have done. Uh, so the first step is you're going to cut six wires of equal length. Uh, or as equal as you can get them because those can be trimmed down to equal length once all of the wires are cut. So you're gonna take two of those wires uh, and a pair and you're gonna place one end in the vise and you're gonna clamp the other end in the vise grips. And then you're gonna twist clockwise. Our goal here is to get to as close to full tension as possible. So we want the wires nice and tight. Uh, we want them to be as close as possible as we can because that makes a nice, even, tight plate. Um, if you have to anneal them between twists, if it starts to get too tight, go ahead and anneal them, and then go back and finish twisting. 
We don't want to over twist because when you over twist it, you run the risk of what's called buckling. Buckling, buckling is when you twist the wires and they're uh, not properly annealed or they're not annealed. And instead of twisting in a nice spiral, they start to twist around themselves. Um, and that is what we want to avoid. So if you do need to anneal partway through, that is perfectly fine. Uh, once you have all the first set twisted, then you're gonna go ahead and twist all six wires into three sets of two. So each one's gonna be paired up with another one. So after this, we're gonna to wanna to anneal again. So once all of the pairs are ready, we're gonna put them on the fire brick and we're gonna go ahead and anneal them again. Uh, we're gonna heat the bronze to red, so you want it to glow. And then we're gonna uh, quench it into the bucket of water to rapidly cool it, uh, or air cool, if that is your preference. Um, I prefer quenching because I find air cooling, if it's not quenched, it does tend to produce a less desirable plate and it does not twist as well. Um, so I find that the entire process falls apart if it's not quenched and rapidly cooled. Uh, you're going to want to do this a couple times. So my preference on annealing these is about five to six times per set. So you can do each set individually. You can do uh, two wires at one time and then the last wire individually. You can anneal all three wires together. Um, that is also personal preference. But the important part is everything is evenly annealed and properly annealed. If the wires aren't all evenly annealed, you'll end up with some spots that are wonky. Uh, some of the plated pieces uh, that I've made that aren't properly annealed, uh, some of those wires aren't going to twist correctly or they'll just get lost in the, the plate or they'll just, they won't twist. And so you'll end up with like two wires that are twisted around the other one. Um, so it's very important that we proper, that properly anneal all of the sets together. So once you have all of the sets annealed, you're going to take them. Uh, these have been pre-twisted and pre-annealed to save some time. So we're going to take them and put them together. Uh, they stack into a triangle shape. And then you're going to take a piece of wire uh, I prefer to use like a 22 gauge brass wire for this part because it's nice and, and stiff. And you're going to wrap the end of it. And this just keeps it in place while we do the final twist. So we want this to stay in more or less a triangular stacked piece of set of wires. So once you have it put together, then we're gonna to wanna to do the other end and clamp it in a vise. So we want this to stay nice and stacked. Uh, we want it to stay nice and even. Push this down here a little bit. The, and then we're gonna put it in the vise. So these wires have been twisted clockwise. So we're gonna put this in the vise and then the other end gets clamped in vice grips. Get this perfect. And then we're gonna twist the opposite way. So these were twisted clockwise. So we wanna twist them counterclockwise. It may take some time and some effort, but at the end, get a nice plated look here. I 
do apologize. It is not as sunny today as I hoped it would be. And then we need to unwrap this end. And you, if you can see, some of these wires did not twist evenly. And we can fix that by just lightly hammering them into place. So you don't want to hammer too hard because you don't want to flatten the bundle. But we can do a little bit of hammer work and twist while we do it. And those should fall right into place. All right. So now we have our final twisted plated piece. Which the construction of which was not too bad, but now we're going to need to finish it. Uh, so this part uses the map torch. We want to use it in as well a ventilated area as possible. Um, I prefer to work where there's a window or a door that could be opened. Uh, that way it all goes out instead of staying in the room. So we're gonna take these ends and these are gonna get fused together. So fusing is the melting together of bronze or silver or any other metal that'll easily flow under the heat of a torch. Uh, the goal here is to heat at least a good portion of the piece to a nice even red temperature. Once you have that nice even glow, you're gonna focus on the ends and let those melt and flow into each other. Uh, a couple of things to watch out for as you're fusing. Make sure you don't focus on one area too much because you will end up burning that area off and it will form a small pellet and roll right down the fire brick. Uh, so we wanna to try to keep it as much material together as possible, we can gain some of that length back once we uh, anneal it and draw it out, but not a ton. Uh, so we want to try to keep it as nice and as long as possible. I will go ahead and get these views. Uh, the ideal fusing angle would be uh, putting your fire brick at about a like 15, 30, 40 degree angle. Um, as you can see in the handout, I have my setup where I have the fire bricks stacked uh, three on each side. And then that top fire brick is kind of set off at an angle on the top one to create kind of a ramp. Uh, once you fuse it, that'll help pull all the material down the ends uh, and that'll help flow a good portion of those ends together. Uh, we will be using the torch, so please use any and all safety uh, precautions and personal protection that you find appropriate. Uh, we do not want to get burned.
we'll give that a second to cool and then we'll pick that up. You will notice when you fuse the ends and release the torch once it's fused, um, you don't want to move it for a couple seconds. It is still, it might not look like liquid, but it is still extremely malleable and fragile. If you move it too quickly, you run the risk of completely breaking off the end that you just fused because it'll separate in a, a semi-gelatinous form. Okay, and we'll get this quenched. All right. So this end has been fused together. It is now one long piece as opposed to the three individual wires. So you'll want to go ahead and do that with the other end as well. Um, once you have both ends fused, we're going to start working on the terminals, squaring them out and drawing them out. So the first step to this is to square them out. Um, so you're going to want to, it's going to look pretty flat to begin with. Uh, so we're going to take our hammer and we're going to strike each side as equally as possible. So do uh, two to three strikes and then rotate 90 degrees, two to three strikes, another 90 degrees, two or three strikes, another 90 degrees, two or three strikes. Um, we're going to repeat this process quite a few times until this looks like it's starting to square out or it's become a square. Um, you are going to want to anneal quite often during this process. So this is the part where if you work it while it's too cold or if it gets too hard, uh, the material will work harden as you hammer it. So if that happens, you do run the risk of uh, flaking. Metal can flake off in a little bits, um, or at the worst, you're going to be looking at some stress cracks or fractures that may have to be refused um, or have some material, filler material melted into it to hold that together at the final piece. Um, if it does stress fracture or crack and it's not caught, it will just break right off once you go to shape it. Um, so this is the part where you're going to want to anneal quite often. Unfortunately, there is no set number of times between each annealing cycle. This is one of the things that as you go on, you'll start to kind of know by feel uh, or by sound or by intuition uh, when the metal is nice and soft and easy to work and when the metal is getting too hard um, and it needs to be annealed again. So unfortunately, there's no set formula here. Uh, it's trial and error. Um, a lot of it is trial and error, um, kind of knowing when, when the metal is ready and when it's time to anneal. So let's go ahead and get at least the first portion squared out. Gonna anneal it again, just the end. Because we're working with a larger piece of bronze than just the individual wires, uh, getting this up to a kneeling color is going to take a little bit more time than we saw with getting the wires just to a kneeling color.
we are getting to the square shape here. All right, so that is mostly squared out. Uh, it has four distinct sides. And now we're gonna work on drawing these out. So it's easiest to do one side and then the other. So what we're gonna wanna do, leaving it in the square shape, is anneal it again. Leaving this in the square shape is the easiest way to draw this out. Using the hammer, we're going to start hitting the metal and then draw it out. So when you hit it, instead of hitting it straight down, you want to do a slight pulling motion on it. Um, if you want to hammer away from me, you can do that too. You do a slight pushing motion to get the metal to move away from you. So we're going to draw this out a little bit. And then we just want these to be a little bit longer than they were when we fused them. Uh, so this is a good length. It's about an inch long, uh, still in the square form, but it does have a little bit of a taper down to the end, uh, which is what we'd like. So we need to round it out, uh, which is much easier than uh, probably the easiest part of the process. Um, so we're gonna anneal it again, because you can never anneal too many times. All right. So because it's a square, we see that it has the four edges. Um, to start rounding it out, we're going to put it with one edge. We're going to basically place it on its edge with an edge facing up. And we're going to hammer straight down onto that edge. And we're going to rotate it to the next edge and do the same thing. And then to the next edge and do the same thing. And the last edge and do the same thing. So as it goes from, as you hammer down on the edges, you'll see that it starts to go from more of a square shape to more of an octagonal shape. Uh, the, octa the octagon is 
crucial to rounding it out because it starts to give it that round edged form. So we are going to anneal one more time. Put it in the quench bucket. So now that we have a semi round shape, we're going to want to round the rest of it out into a completely smooth round terminal. Uh, we're, we're, the way we achieve that is now that we have the octagon, we're going to hit each uh, surface of the terminal by putting it on the anvil and we're going to rotate it as it goes. And this will bring all of the corners around and smooth them all out very nicely. And as we go, we'll check to make sure it's getting nice and round and even. And kneel as often as you need to, because we don't want to get all the way down to this part of the uh, the piece and have it crack and break. And then what we're left with at the end of this is a nice rounded out terminal. That's about an inch long uh, and it does have a nice taper to the end. So we would just need to repeat that with the other side and then both terminals would be finished. Uh, once you are finished with that, comes time to do the final work, cleaning, uh, shaping, and polishing. So the first step would be uh, to pickle the piece. So there are any number of commercial uh, products available. Uh, Spirex number two is a great commercial pickle. Um, pickling is a, a solution that you put the piece in that removes all of this discoloration and fire scale on the piece. Uh, and instead of making it a, a multicolored mess, uh, makes it all a nice, even, uh, most of it looks like a pink color, uh, removes all of this excess from the piece. Um, I use a homemade uh, pickle, which is two cups water, two cups vinegar, and four teaspoons of salt. Um, so you're going to boil the water and vinegar, vinegar together. Uh, it's going to smell terrible. 
uh, and put it in a glass or a ceramic casserole dish. Uh, we don't want to use metal because we do use metal. Um, anything other than like copper or um, like a wooden tong um, or anything other than a, a copper dish is going to create a permanent discoloration on the piece. Uh, so glass or ceramic is your safest bet, but do not use it for food after. Once you use it for pickle, that's it. It's going to have to be your permanent pickling casserole dish. Uh, so boil the vinegar and water together and then pour it into the casserole dish and add four teaspoons of salt. Uh, and then you put your piece in there and let it sit for about five minutes and then take a pair of copper or wooden tongs and flip it and then let it sit for another five minutes. Uh, if it doesn't look like it removed all of the fire scale uh, or if it's not clean enough, go ahead and leave it in there for another five or 10 minutes. Just check on it and make sure that it's all cleaned and it's where you would like it to be. Um, it is best to do this while the pickle is hot because it's most effective, but you can also do it cold, but it will take a longer amount of time. Uh, so doing it hot takes about 10 minutes and then you take it out and we wanna neutralize it. Uh, so what we're gonna do is add about a cup of water and then uh, baking powder. Uh, so the stuff that you keep in the fridge for the, to keep the odors out, or uh, you can grab a box at the store and use it specifically for this. Uh, you're gonna mix a cup of water, hot water with baking powder and then put the piece in it. Uh, and that will neutralize the uh, acidic nature of the pickling solution. Then you're gonna wanna rinse it off with warm water and towel it completely dry. And you're left with a nice, almost pinkish looking uh, final piece. So. Once you have it all pickled, then we're going to want to kind of clean it up a little bit to bring it back to that nice bronze golden color. Uh, bronze shines gorgeously once it's cleaned up. Uh, so we're going to take varying, you're going to take various grits of sandpaper. Um, I would start at about 400 and then I go to about 900 or 1000 grit and go down the whole piece um, with one grit and then repeat it all the way up. Um, as you do so, you're going to start removing all of that pink color and it's going to start getting back to that nice golden shine. Um, once you're finished with that, then we're going to want to shape it. So it's probably work hardened by now. So we're going to need to shape first the terminals and then we're going to want to shape the rest of the piece. Uh, so the terminals are going to want to kind of curve a little bit to fit the curvature of the wrist, but you don't want them curving a ton. Um, so what you would do is uh, anneal the ends again. Okay. And this is where the anvil horn comes in handy. And you're going to put the, the terminal on the anvil horn and just very, very gently use the curve of the horn to get the anvil curve just a little bit. We want just a little bit of curve on it. And then we're gonna shape the rest of it by hand. Uh, so you're gonna go ahead and take it in both hands and just start bending it ever so slightly around and make a semicircle shape. And you'll see it starts to, to curve around, which is perfect. And we're gonna go ahead and take that curve Make it a little tighter as we go. The best way to measure this is to take the measurement of the wrist that you want to put it on. So let's say seven and a half inches. And we want to shape this out and leave a one inch gap between the terminal ends. Um, that is the ideal spot for this. And 
And we're going to keep going. And you're going to, you may need to anneal the ends again uh, just to get the rest of it shaped well. The ends are always going to be the hardest part to shape because instead of being a nice flexible braid of thinner wires, it's just one big hunk uh, that has been fused together. And you're just going to keep going until you get the nice shape that you want. And then once you are finished and you have the, the shape that you want, you're going to go ahead and take that sandpaper again and just give it a nice light uh, sandpaper. Uh, brush. Uh, so this is more or less the correct shape. Uh, you want it nice and round to fit on the wrist. Uh, so go ahead and give it another kind of shine with the, the sandpapers. Uh, it's easiest to do the initial clean while it's nice and straight. Uh, that way you can go right up and down the length of it. Um, it's a little harder to do once it's curved. So uh, it's easier to do the final polish now than it would be to clean the entire piece. Uh, so go ahead and give it a final polish. And then once you are finished, uh, you have a plated arm ring. Uh, this one was uh, done in silver. This is my example for today. Uh, so this is what it should look like finished. Um, it is a lot of trial and error for it. Uh, so this process does take some time to get used to. Um, it does take a little bit of uh, patience, but it makes some beautiful pieces uh, that are 100% historically accurate and would have been found and have been found uh, in period graves and hoard finds. Um, so a couple things uh, that are not in the handout that I, I kind of want to touch on. Uh, the first thing is don't be afraid to fail at it. Um, if you go out and you make, you say, I'm going to make three pieces today, you end up with one, that is perfect. Like you still did one and that's, that's great. Um, it is not a, it's a pretty forgiving art, uh, but it can be a little challenging at times. Uh, so never, never be afraid to go out there, uh, try to make three and end up with one because you still ended up doing one beautiful piece. Uh, and the ones that you didn't quite make as well as you could have, or you don't think it turned out very well, um, you still learn a lot of things from that those pieces. Um, things that you don't want to do again, or things to do better next time. Uh, things you didn't do that you should have done. Um, so every piece is a learning experience. Uh, the second one is like perfection is a modern construct. So there are very, very few perfectly gorgeous and perfect pieces in period. Every piece in period has at least uh, one thing where you look at it and say, boy, that is a design choice. Um, there is no, there's no such thing as perfect. So every piece is going to have its own little things. Um, and that's perfectly fine too. Uh, it took me a long time to accept that um, if it wasn't perfect, then it wasn't good enough. Um, it doesn't have to be 100% perfect unless you're going for 
uh, a kingly or princely piece, uh, something that would have been uh, made by the highest artisan in the Viking age and uh, was gifted to uh, a Jarl or a king. Um, every piece is gonna have its own quirks, its own flaws. Uh, you're gonna see things that other people may not and that's, that's perfectly fine too. Um, each piece is unique. So that's the one thing I like about uh, handmade is everything is, no, no piece is the same as the others. Um, so there is no, there is no perfection. Um, you can make perfectly beautiful artifacts, um, gorgeous pieces, things that could be in museums. Um, and they are, those are, those are perfect. Uh, and you could also make something that uh, has a slight uh, shaping issue, and that's also perfect. Um, so don't be afraid to go out there and make make things that uh, don't quite meet up to your standards because it is still beautiful and wonderful. Um, and you still made it. So uh, there, the handout is in the chat. So go, feel free to print that, share it. Um, Use it in the future, uh, do with it what you will. Um, I am always available to chat on Facebook, uh, Sean Geppert on Facebook. Um, I'm always happy to answer questions, always happy to help out. Um, and that is that is it. Do you have any questions? My only question would be, you talked about the uh, it being easier to sand and clean and polish once it's when it's straight. Mm -hmm. But if your glass jar, your casserole dish is, you know, a size kind size, is it okay to shape it and do the terminals before doing all that? Just makes it a little harder to uh, sand. Yes, absolutely. Um, it just makes it a little harder to get into those tight curves. Um, so you can either use your finger, uh, put the sandpaper on your finger, and do it that way. Or I have a. If I can grab it here really quickly, um, you can make yourself what's called a sanding stick. Um, so that's just basically a dowel with sandpaper wrapped around it. I do not have it here with me. Um, it's got sandpaper wrapped around it and then taped at the top and bottom. Um, so that saves your, your hands the work of having to kind of crook your finger in there. Um, you can use a standing stick instead and kind of go around the inside. Um, if it's not big enough and you need a shape of a forehand, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, it's just a little bit more like time consuming, but that would be about it. Okay, cool. Thank you. So um, that is it. Um, I want to thank you so much for coming today. I really appreciate you being here and uh, taking the class. Uh, do you have any feedback? So that would be fantastic. Um, no, not really. What I found kind of interesting is that uh, when you were either hammering or using your torch, your mic is recognizes that it's a, a Groaning <laughs> sound and cuts out. So, oh, does it? Oh, okay. When you're That's doing, it, but I guess in future, be aware of that and don't talk when you're doing that. But I don't know if you Perfect. did or not. I don't think I missed anything. So, hey, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I really appreciate it. And uh, if you have, like I said, if you have any other questions, uh, if you ever want to uh, have any questions or need some help, I'm always available. So, let me know. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day today. You too. Bye.